This is a PDF file, but if I open it in a browser, it is actually a fully functional large language model similar to ChatGPT. For example, I can type in hello, send it to the AI, and get a response to my input. And all of this is running directly in nothing but a PDF file. At this point, you might be wondering how this is even remotely possible. But to understand how it all works, we have to start all the way back in 1996. Adobe releases a plugin for their PDF render Acrobat, enabling near-arbitrary JS execution in the file intended for form autocomplete checkboxes and so on. This was later adopted into 2006 PDF standards and soon after implemented by the Chromium browser with its PDF VM renderer, keeping most of the JS features intact. Fast forward to today, while many browsers recognize the potential security risks of allowing arbitrary JS execution in PDFs, Google Chrome's PDF VM continues to support the JS features. And recently, with this neglected feature, I saw a developer adding 2210 Create Doom PDF, a single PDF capable of running the entire game of Doom. This got me thinking, since we're now stuffing AI into literally everything from monitors to refrigerators and even toothbrushes, would it be possible to create a PDF that runs AI? But before we actually get into the AI part of it all, let's first talk about how JS execution in PDFs even works. Under the hood, the PDF is essentially a collection of index objects that's more or less like an array, helping it lazy load its contents. On loading a PDF, Adobe Acrobat and PDF VM goes through these objects and looks for a specially formatted object that contains a special key and the payload JS code. Then, it will simply run that code on the document. But while this sounds simple in theory, making a properly formatted PDF by hand is incredibly tedious, due to the various quirks of the file format. So instead, we'll be using a Python library known as PDFRW to handle the creation of PDFs for us, and then we can use a few simple method calls to achieve that special object with the payload JS code. But as it turns out, running JS in a PDF isn't as straightforward as running it in a browser. Many of the standard built-in objects are noticeably missing. For example, console.log, or for that matter, the entire console object, doesn't exist. Instead, the easiest way to log a message is through the app.alert function. For example, let's see how we can make a PDF file that simply gives an alert message. In order to do this, I create a PDF RW Python script that reads a JS file containing our alert function, and then creates a PDF with that JS code injected. Now if I open the output PDF in a Chromium-based browser, I get the alert pop-up. Pretty neat. Now that we have an idea of how running JS in a PDF could possibly work, we can start doing the actual AI part of it all. My initial idea for running AI, or more specifically a LLM in a PDF, was to somewhat recreate ChatGPT with the OpenAI API. But this quickly ran into an issue. You see, the original Adobe Acrobat PDF FJS specification had some crazy stuff. The ability to detect monitors connected to your system, 3D rendering, and a ton more. Now, of course, Chromium wasn't completely senseless when they ported the Adobe standards. They removed many of the unreasonable features. However, one of the most important features that they removed, which kind of makes sense in hindsight, was the ability to make web requests. This was a devastating blow to what was supposed to be a quick weekend project. If I couldn't make web requests, I couldn't possibly access OpenAI's API. At this point, I had two options. Give up, or do the unthinkable. Port an entire LLM runtime in addition to the entire large language model itself into a PDF. And if you're watching this video, you probably know which one I went with. Clearly, I needed some form of LLM runtime that worked in JS, since that was what I needed to port it into a PDF. And for this purpose, Raul Shetty's LLM.js was perfect. Essentially, all he did was simply compile the famous llama.cpp runtime into JavaScript. And if you're wondering how that's possible, allow me to introduce you to mscripten, a tool that turns C or C++ code into WebAssembly, creating a virtual memory, file system, and more to run the program. And while LLM.js works surprisingly well in the browser, putting it into a PDF was a different story. In order to test it out, I put the entire LLM JS module code into the JS code I was to embed into the PDF, right under my original alert statement. Now, if everything is running without error, the alert statement should still work. It should still alert something on the page, but it didn't. This reveals possibly the most annoying factor of coding in a PDF. If your code has any errors, it'll simply not run at all, not giving any sort of viewable error message, likely due to the fact that there was nowhere to log the error message anyway. Now, a partial workaround was to put the entire code in a try catch block, but for certain errors like in this current case, it just refused to run altogether. Clearly, something was fundamentally wrong with what we were doing. As it turns out, the current LLM.js mscripting compiler was turning the output code into WebAssembly, a technology that literally didn't exist back when 
when a PDF standard were written. So needless to say, it couldn't work. Thankfully, Wasm has a predecessor known as ASM.js. Instead of being a standalone language like Wasm, ASM.js was simply a subset of JavaScript, which means that anything that can run JavaScript can run ASM.js. So this is exactly what we want to compile llama.cpp into. Unfortunately, however, the current version of mscript no longer supports compiling into ASM.js. But instead, what we can do is downgrade mscript all the way down to version 1.39.20 for ASM.js support. Now we can actually compile llama.cpp. We'll be using the llama CLI command line tool, which is available in one clean file as our entry point, and we can essentially run the compiled output in JavaScript just as if we were running it in the command line. You do have to make a few changes to llama.cpp source to get it all to compile and to work, including adding llama CLI into the makefile and to flush the stream at the end of the CLI, but it wasn't too bad. Now with our output.js, it was rather tedious editing the template code around a huge compiled mess. So instead, I changed the Python build script a little so that it replaced a specific comment in the JS template file with the entire output code in another source file. Now, in order to actually call the CLI, we have to change a few things on the module object, which is the variable declared in the compiled source. First, we can use module.arguments to change what arguments we're calling the CLI with. For now, just the help flag. Then we can also redirect the standard output and error from the module by setting module.print and module.print error functions. For now, we'll just send them to app.alert. Now, while opening the PDF successfully prints a few messages from help, I seem to occasionally get some sort of error message about the performance object not being defined, again, due to the weird PDF globals. Thankfully, this was decently easy to fix. After a quick search, the only place performance was used in a compiled output is with performance.now. But as it turns out, this is very similar to date.now. Both return timestamps, albeit performance.now is a bit more accurate. So what we can do is simply polyfill performance with the date class in a prescript that we can add during compilation. And with that, running the help command completely works. I was cautiously optimistic that the whole thing could work out. Before we get into actually running models, let's try to work on a bit of a UI for a PDF, including a console for reading output, since reading output of llama.cpp with alerts was incredibly painful. Unfortunately, Adobe's PDF.js doesn't allow you to directly modify text on a page. However, since it was designed for autofilling forms, text boxes can be controlled with JavaScript. So for a console, instead of having lines of text, we'll have lines of text boxes that we can update. Now, a side effect is that you can literally modify the content in the console, but hey, at this point, I'm not asking for much more than for it to work. All we have to do now is to write a bit of code to create said text boxes in our Python script with a few parameters like size, coordinates, and also assign them a unique ID to reference later. Then to modify the text box in our JS code, we can simply use the global this.get field method with the given ID and access dot value to modify it. This is pretty similar to how it would work in a normal DOM. Finally, with a bit of array magic to keep track of the lines in a console, we can essentially recreate the console.log function for our simulated console. Then I also created a simple function to make buttons in a Python code similar to the text box. Buttons also take an additional property for the function to run when it is pressed. In this function, we can put the entire module code in initializers, ensuring to update the output property to use our simulated console. What we have now is a button and a PDF that we can press to get the output of any llama.cpp CLI call on our simulated console. With that, we're ready to run the first LLM inference. But first, we need to actually figure out how to get a large language model into llama.cpp to run in the first place. The runtime mainly loads models with the ggUF quantization format stored in a .ggUF file. However, it's a bit difficult to get that file into our CLI argument since it takes a path. We seemingly have no file system to work with, but mscript Scripten actually handles all that for us. It creates an entire simulated file system that we can access with mscripten's own FS implementation. So our goal is to write the ggUF file into the file system with FS and then use it in a CLI with its path. However, there's a bit of a dilemma. If I try to write the file before the entire module loads, I wouldn't have access to FS at all. But at the same time, if I write the file after the entire module loads, llama.cpp wouldn't be able to access the file since I didn't write it yet. So we need to somehow write the file in the module C++ itself. In order to do this, we'll call mscripten's JS macro, which allows you to run JS code inside C++. Specifically, we'll call a function named writeFile with two variables as arguments, the file name and the file content. Then in our main code above the entire module code, we can define writeFile and the two variables. First, we'll save an arbitrary file name into the file name variable. Then we'll convert the entire ggUF file into base64 and save it into the file content variable. Finally, in writeFile, we convert the base64 file contents into a uint8 array and write it with fs into the file system. Now we can access the ggUF file normally in a CLI arguments by referencing our file name variable. 
Final thing that we had to do was to pick a model to run. It's clear that running anything in a PDF, especially an entire large language model, is going to be slow. So I decided to start small. Now typically small in the LLM community meant perhaps a billion parameters, but that was still around at one gigabyte of model files. We have to go even smaller. After a bit of research, I eventually settled on Tiny LLM, a 10 million parameter proof of concept model that seemed to be exactly what I wanted. Now this isn't a chat or instruction to the model. In other words, all I can do is take an input and predict the reasonable next words. In fact, it isn't even the best at doing that. It tends to generate some gibberish. However, it is still an absolutely tiny large language model. Again, to prevent having to edit a massive document, I added a placeholder string into the file content variable, which has replaced that build time by the Python script with the base64 version of the model GGUF. Now we can set up the arguments that we're calling llama.cpp with. First, the dash m flag precedes our model path, which we defined earlier. Then the dash p flag provides our prompt. Let's just say hi for now. Finally, I set the context size to a smaller amount and also lowered the output tokens to predict just two to speed things up. But if we hop over to the PDF, it once again complains about a missing global object, crypto. In this case, it actually gave to code necessary to polyfill and it was a relatively easy fix. And with that, here's the first working LLM running in a PDF file. The text it generated definitely wasn't coherent or meaningful, but it was a solid proof of concept. It was also incredibly slow, but that was expected for various reasons, including the fact that it was running completely on CPU and a virtual simulated environment from Inscription, which is likely slowing things down. I also wouldn't count on a PDF.js interpreter being optimal either. Nevertheless, now it was time to scale up to a larger model. But before we can do that, we had to fix a few things with Inscription's virtual memory system. First of all, I had to change the memory limits on the compiled output a little bit, set the minimum to a gigabyte, and allowed it to scale up to all the way to 1.4 gigabytes, which happens to be the maximum amount Chrome allows to be allocated to a tab. Unfortunately, they removed the ability to change its cap a while back, so we're stuck with this. Nonetheless, 1.4 gigabytes is still plenty for the small models we're running. Llama.cpp also occasionally complained about memory alignment and addresses failing certain assertions, again, likely due to the simulated memory. So as much as it was sort of unsafe, I simply removed those assertions. After all, I was working in a sandbox PDF file, so nothing could really go wrong. Indeed, removing those assertions, everything seemed to work perfectly fine with our models. Now, I went around looking for yet another model, this time slightly bigger than 10 million parameters. The best I found was a 135 million parameter model designed by Hugging Face themselves, known as Small LLM 2. It was of a decent quality in an absolutely tiny LLM as well. But when I tried to put it in my PDF, it complained about not recognizing the model vocabulary, which was strange since my local version of Llama CLI accepted it just fine. At this point, I have to admit something. At the start, I simply copied the mscripted compile script from llm.js, but this script resets Llama CVP back to a specific version hash, and while that version was likely new back when it was written, this version is now significantly outdated. Outdated as in a few months, which is apparently a lot of time on the cutting edge. I did try to compile a newer version, but there were numerous compiler errors which I did end up fixing, but also numerous exceptions that just kept occurring without any description at all. So I thought it simply wasn't worth updating since most of the changes were simply performance gains that I figured wouldn't really matter at this point in a PDF file. But as it turns out, at that version, the vocabulary for small LLM wasn't implemented yet. But this wasn't as big of an issue as I thought. Looking through the llama.cpp pull request, I found a PR which added small LLM support and simply transposed the changes as best as I can onto my local copy, which was reverted to that hash. And although the file structure was a little bit different, surprisingly, it actually worked. My vision of having some sort of a chat LLM in a PDF was almost achieved, but the entire process was just way too slow. I knew that there had to be some form of optimization that I was missing out on. Reading through a Llama CLI flags, I tried all sorts of different tweaks, enabling flash attention, trying to keep the model in memory, and even disabling KV cache, but none of them seemed to make a difference. It wasn't until I was building the final version of this project to publish when I noticed a strange quirk. In order to understand this, we have to talk about quantization. GGUF versions of LLMs are typically referred to as quantizations or quants, essentially compressing the model from the default floating point 16 accuracy to less accurate 8-bit, 4-bit, or even 2-bit integers. Now, while it is true that smaller quantizations are smaller models in file size, it isn't necessarily true that smaller quantizations are faster. Most CPUs and GPUs in modern computers are typically optimized for 8-bit and 4-bit operations. Thus, 8-bit and 4-bit quantizations were the fastest, with 8-bit typically faster than something like 6-bit quantization. Thus, when downloading models for this project, I naturally use 4-bit LLMs, which are smaller and thus faster to load, while in theory being as fast as possible. But what I didn't realize until at the end when trying out a 8-bit model for the first time was the fact that the 
8-bit model was even faster than the 4-bit model. This threw me for a loop, but while I'm not completely sure about why, it likely has to do with the mscript and virtual machine being optimized for 8-bit operations more than 4-bit. Either way, I switched over to 8-bit quants for all my models, and although it takes a bit longer to load, the inference speed boosts are definitely worth it. Now that I had an idea of how to optimize and load models, I wanted to try out a few more options. Some of the best I found include Tiny Stories, a LLM capable of generating coherent text under 10 million parameters, as well as the Pythia suite of models for all different sizes going down to 14 million parameters. I am genuinely impressed with how small and yet relatively capable these models are. Prior to doing this project, it never even occurred to me that a model under 0.5 billion parameters could generate coherent text, but evidently there is much out there to prove me wrong. From what I found, Tiny Stories 3 million parameters is great for testing inference on a PDF, just due to how fast it is compared to all of the other models. On the other hand, the Pythia suite of models allow me to do a very interesting experiment with speculative decoding, or essentially having a smaller model proposing output tokens for a larger, more powerful model to verify, instead of having the larger model generating all the tokens, which could be slower. Since speculative decoding required the models to have the same vocabulary, I picked the 14 million and 31 million parameter Pythia model. All I had to change in the source code was to add another model file, in this case Pythia 14 million, to write into the file system and choose that file for the so-called draft model, while using Pythia 31 million parameter as my main model. Not so surprisingly though, in our case, this wasn't faster than just directly running one model, if not sometimes even slower. This could be due to various reasons, but primarily we weren't generating enough tokens to get any overlap between the models outputs, and not to mention the size gap between the models is honestly somewhat negligible, making speculative decoding not as efficient as it would be between a very small and a very large model. Nonetheless, it was still very interesting to see speculative decoding working in a literal PDF file. Last thing that I wanted to do was run an instruction tune model. This meant that instead of simply completing what I am saying, the model was actually able to respond to what I am saying. Implementing this has two decently simple steps. First, find a model that is instruction tuned. These typically are variants of base models like the small LLM 135 million parameter instruction tune or the Pythia 31 million parameter chat fine tune. After loading a new model, which in this case is the small LLM chat tune, the other thing that we have to do to make it work was to include a few special tokens in a prompt to distinguish between between the user query and the assistant response. Lamina CAP can handle the rest for us. So now, using small LLM 135 million parameter, if we say hi, instead of completing an arbitrary sentence, it actually responds to me. Unfortunately, we still don't have the ability to send a follow-up request in the chat. If we send something again, it's a completely independent run. However, the way chat inference works is that if I wanted to continue the chat conversation with another message, the LLM has to reprocess all the tokens in a chat history. While you can do caching with requests, this was rather difficult to achieve in our current situation because we're literally creating a new instance of the virtual environment around llama.cpp for every request. Either way, even if there were caching, it would still be extremely slow. So because of all of that, I decided to leave out chat history for now. All I had to do now was a couple of final touches. I added a new button separating between the ask function with a chat template and the completion button without the chat template. Then I also added a few inputs for context length and output tokens, which feed into the arguments of llama.cpp. Finally, I added some initial messages in the console for documentation and also made a few more tweaks to the entire PDF. And with all that, I present to you LLM.PDF, the first LLM engine and LLM inference running completely in nothing but a PDF file. If you want to try out LLM.PDF, go to evanjoedev.github.io slash LLM.PDF. There are three versions for trying out and downloading. I recommend Tiny Stories for a quick experience and Pythia to try out the chat. If you want to load your own models or try out the more powerful small LLM model, you can go to github.com slash evanjoedev slash LLM.PDF for documentation and build instructions. Huge thank you to DoomPDF and LLM .js for inspiring this project, and to llama.cpp for powering llm.pdf. Also, a shout out to the people behind the various models used in this project, such as Pythia, Tiny Stories, and Tiny LLM. Again, if you want to check out the source code behind llm.pdf or contribute, it's available at github.com slash evanjodev slash llm.pdf. As always, is this project particularly useful? No, but it is pretty cool and an interesting proof of concept. I hope you guys enjoyed today's video, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace!